Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of the American Center in Moscow, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Emira Tluhanova, and I'm a literary enthusiast from Moscow. I also studied literature in Lincoln, Nebraska. Tonight, I'm happy to host the reading by a wonderful poet, translator, and editor, Matvey Yankilevich. His books include the poetry collection, Some Words, Worlds for Dr. Watt, Alpha Donut, and most recently, Dead Winter, as well as the translations, Today I Wrote Nothing, the selected writings of Daniel Arms and Alexander Vidensky's invitation for me to think, winner of the 2014 National Translation Award. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the National Endowment for Humanities, and Civitella Ranieri. In the 1990s, he co founded Ugly Duckling Press, where he produced a variety of books, chapbooks, periodical, and broadsides, co edited 6x6 magazine, and curated the Eastern European Poet Series. As of 2022, he is editor of World Poetry Books, a non-profit publisher of poetry and translation. In the spring of this year, he founded the literary small press, Winter Editions. He has written and lectured on the history and politics of small press publishing, on translation, and on various subjects in Russian literature. He teaches translation at Columbia University's School of the Arts. Tonight, Matvey is going to read his poems to us, and then we'll get a chance to ask some questions. You can drop them in the chat and I'll be happy to post them to our poet tonight. And our team at AMC has posted on social media a link to the poem that will be read tonight, accompanied by their side-by-side -side Russian translations, so you can read them along. Matvey, welcome to read the poet. Give me the poet. Matvey, we unfortunately are muted. We can't hear you now. It's a pleasure okay. to be here. Thank you. Uh, happy to host you. Добрый вечер. Um, Добрый I'm вечер. Not... <laughs> I think it's the first time someone greets us in Russian. So yeah. We're happy to have that. <laughs> um, I am going to read poems from a few few books, um, some earlier poems and some more recent. Um, and uh, I'll start with some poems from this book called Alpha Donut, um, and which came out maybe 10 years ago. Um, this poem is called Buttons. This text is written on buttons so tightly sewn to each other that no one can read it. Clarify, this text is written on the inside side of many buttons, all of which are sewn together in a necklace of buttons so that you can't even see the text. In fact, the beaded and contiguous nature of these buttons makes it impossible to even know which side of each button is its inside side. In the necklace of buttons, sides don't matter. Every side touches, is in contact. Even so, the text is written only on the inside side, the side which was once in contact with was touching the clothing people wore the clothing of the people who once wore it, but now do not wear the clothing because it does not have buttons. During the war, all the buttons fell off. Those that didn't fall off were cut from the clothing of the people. No, the buttons no longer touch the clothing. Instead, they touch each other on all sides. Buttons have two sides and two sides only, at least these buttons. No one can read this text. It's on the buttons and the buttons touch, and so there's no room for an eye to get in there in between the buttons. No, the button holes don't help either. They're stuffed with thread, the thread that keeps the buttons touching. These buttons are a sort of entertainment, you might say. Their holes are full of thread, their sides touch. 
Not even imaginary characters can read the text, not even a thought experiment. Boris can't read it even if I asked him to. Benita Canova can't read it, nor can Nietzsche. The hysteric one can't, and the ontological one too. The buttons are so close together, you can't even unbutton them. You can't even imagine them. These are real buttons. My friends can't read the buttons, and you, I don't even know my friends, because on one side they are my friends, and on another they're somebody else's friend. Yours, maybe. Their own, definitely. Imaginary, perhaps, yes. Buttons, the buttons. I've never been so afraid of buttons. Um, and uh, I think that the the uh, PDF that uh, was provided uh, will have more poems than I'm actually going to have time to read. So um, I'll skip some of the poems here and there. Um, but I'll read this next one, which is called Family Tree. My cigarette holder was made of Russian wood in Novgorod or around there somewhere where my grandparents' grandparents used to farm the land on the other side of which my other grandparents' grandparents were forbidden to even own it, thousands of miles from where my other grandparents' grandparents were cowboys and merchants, schemers, suicides, or kind-hearted landowners, musicians and bourgeois revolutionaries as they chose to be. Wooden cigarette holders are a dime a dozen talking hard currency. Their brevity, however, and resistance to gravity make them temporary pleasures. They have as much to do with roots. Um, and this one I'll read, uh, this next one, I'm going to skip one and then read a very short poem. Uh, the book is peppered with very short poems. This book is peppered with very short poems called that I refer to as bar poems. Um, and they're part of a numbered series, but kind of uh, the numbers didn't make sense anymore after 100 or so. So uh, this one uh, in English goes like this. That beer seems tall from here. And then I'll read the two translations that uh, a friend of mine did, Igor Satanovsky. Uh, two versions of the same poem. Эта кружка на столе пивной нависает башней надо мной. Эта кружка пива, о чудо, выглядит высокой отсюда. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch over to uh, another book called Some Worlds for Dr. Vote. Um, this came out in, I think, 2015. It's a long poem uh, in uh, or cycle. Um, uh, and I will read a few parts um, that were translated by Alexander Skidan. Um, I should say maybe that Dr. Vote or Dr. What is a, just a character, invented character, and I don't actually know much about him, um, but that's the you, I guess, in these poems. The wind cools you, but why the coffee lukewarm? Long waves of ignorance wash over your toes. The swimmer leans into the current, dries in the wind. Between is a world of shadow, the alphabet follows, the rule of the letter. Smell the copper dust under the graver, the scent of black, wove paper and nitric acid in the rough basement. Take it to a mirror, or let this mirror come to touch everything that exists in order to be crammed into a book, even metaphysics even hips. See how it's bound at one edge, suggesting entrance or what is said is done. What's left of this world is color, 
the flapping pulp, transparent white, the turning of a page, a minute, a new year. When the fishermen throw their nets, there is a very quiet applause and sometimes a giggle, hardly auditory, like the gap between two insect landings on the map of the empire. Uh, this is number 15 from the same series. Poe's, um, I should say that this, uh, this poem takes a little bit of a quote uh, from or borrows from a, a poem by Arkady Drigomoshenko. Pose a world as a tautology or an equilibrium, a state of balance or static, something like the river flows, already redundant, what in fact is its shape. For instance, someone gave you this beer so you can't do anything about it. You can drink it as long as you stand relatively still, describing to yourself the view or the way the tree trunks lay in the northern woods, leafless then, save for the ground cover, so that vision is not a noun, but the unachievable form of the verb reading, legere. Greeks choose to speak, Romans pick through the ruins. All this is well known, but bears repeating. Cherry blossoms in the rain, the season's emotional efficacy, to chew the crust, another way to bite down. Even the shapes of eros, you know, are finite. Uh, this is number 30 from the same series. In the shape of a thing, another. Fire in the match. Take out the wood and leave it alone or strike it. That is this over there to bring it closer almost to the point of exception. The thing maps a thought, all mapping corrupted by the new world. You make an idea of it, chart an object from life, cut it out of it, and what's that left in your hand? So I, I'm going to switch gears to another book, uh, or actually a long series, uh, part of which was published in this little book, Dead Winter, uh, which is an ongoing long-term project about winter. Uh, and it's called From a Winter Notebook. The, the whole series is called From a Winter Notebook. Um, um, that's about it. I'll say all, all I'll say about it. Um, okay, uh, and there are untitled poems in this series, um, each of which, as you'll see, has the word winter in it in the first or last line. Winter's disappointments include your fears line up with my faults so perfectly it's nearly cause for celebration. Come false spring's brief brow-beating heat, wild chives spew forth, brown trees bud hopefully, and roses open wanly, lacking summer's vigor. So old love warms quietly the quiet room, bed, desk, dresser, records, dining table, same as desk, and pyramids of half-read books, time-loved. My faults are finally irreparable. Fears are for young embrace. I'll likely not reply with reciprocity and passion your plaintive Facebook message. Don't ask me how void beckons, vacant, lowered eyes seduce, and edge draws one precipitously near affection's empty promise. Old ships love storms all the more at distance safe though dry dock is mundane and everywhere repairs 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 uh, and i'm going to skip uh, around uh, skip a few here in this um, series um, 
this is uh, on page 13 of the of the um, PDF. In winter, I begin again, again to be pretensiosen, and coming home to a record of my successful arrival in the world, I celebrate myself with as mediocre a wine as I can afford to be cut off from chatter. A pressure builds behind the eyes. The kettle whines, the record skips. I need not publish this. Just throw it, for I've been good and slept alone and not been touched by anything, not even birdsong, nor friends, nor first snow on ancient wharves, only the cold cement through thin soles in the warehouse where half the lights work. I bring them with me to where I forget to follow through, where it's enough to say these few things. I'm going to skip another one and um, um, <clears throat> okay this one uh, as uh, this one as many of them do have a little bit of quotation or reference to uh, older poems this has a little bit of Mandelstam and a little bit of Pasternak in it though in a very small way winter a landscape in questions old punctuation the floorboards creaking i step out to bitter moons don't worry the notebooks are all with the proper authorities such little things make life and buttonholes let it seep out it can happen in no time and now it's over the window cracks the landscape into allegory the grove of spruce or pine over there, it stands apart. The planner is full, and it's only February. OK, uh, this is another in the same series. It sounded so much better before I wrote it down. Even my jealousy seemed winged like marinas does the road wind up hill all the way my teeth will rot but i'll be rot i hope before that happens then will words mean what they say finally then will you stop asking like strawberries late kisses make my lips itch lately all i see in whom i love is aging their eyes dig deeper, dead birds underfoot. Will there be only one rhythm in hell? One sound? Must I, must I walk to the very end? Cell towers have replaced the guard posts. Serpentine parkways coil upward, middle paths to mediocre death. Science finds cigarettes addictive. I feel the same about tomatoes. Actually, it's people, our ken for adaptation. It was my job, they say. I did what I was told. Yes, sir. No, sir. Let's have ourselves one last good laugh at ourselves and drop the curtain. That's what I miss most with you, that laughing. After you had found me frozen at the bus stop, pulled me back, though you didn't want me, running barefoot, naked, over winter avenues. <clears throat> um, I'm going to skip another one, and uh, this is on page 18 of the PDF. Um, <clears throat> My fingers, thorns of winter blackberry or bramble, shall I dare to touch soft things? I wash in sun's broad disinfecting rays. Some knowledge of the frequency of bugs is on my vita. 
I comb my hair with sticks. Weeds only grow here. For the transaction that would profit you, I have no assets. But if my word is sweet to you, come sit with me. This pebble will make room for three if we ask death move a little over. True, I have not much to wear for evening, which makes me very little mad as long as you're not vexed by staying home, a word that means not much but a room to visit, optionally clothed. These days my shadow startles me, I it, and could be anywhere the same, while you can change. I'll watch you changing, try to be a poet better than the grass, almost as good as the wind. Okay, I'll, <clears throat> I'll read this slightly longer one on 19. Um, consciousness here above the winter asphalt. Afar, a grove strikes up a conversation. The time before last left a hand on the bed. Belated tears, months late, ears waxing over the letters in which one would explain it all. Turn the calendar around the other way. Make plans for life under the circumstances. Don't forget what's on the stove, keys in the lock. Seen from a movie, I make in my spare mind. Linear C, animals, plants, the story of Storyville here at Babylon Station, almost time when all the trains depart at once. Turn up the radio and the TV set while you're at it. Something as absurd as winter pavement, more air than can I afford. Somewhere nearby is the field of perception I call my own, calibrated to echo, hinged, derivative of itself, sufficient to me as I was in what was lost to me. This field where I play fetch, there are three of us, the bracket of the body, the enviable plastic bag falling so softly on the page like Williams, who doesn't want to go to bed for to invent tomorrow's diagnoses, the grove grumbling its empty stomach of leaves. <clears throat> a stifled cottage in the rocks under the sway and squall of eucalyptus woods grown quick for paper death. Year round I plant and harvest, pace where blue and white hydrangeas line stone walls through December, then yield to camellias bloom. Cows by the ocean Woodcutters in the yard, weed whackers send the pollen flying. Insects buzzardly complete their gyred memoirs around my unwashed hair. Where snails climb plaster, stone keeps cold longer than the air can hold it. I read Quevedo, smirking to myself, content alone. Drink coffee if it's bitter to farm and nothing else, breathe in, breathe out, make do, here to be known as the anonymous, master of the winter landscape in temperate climes. Um, and I think finally I'll read this uh, last poem in the PDF that was handed out. Um, As winter went on, every morning spoon of buckwheat honey resembled more the taste of that isosceles at midpoint of your weight. Its smell brought sweetly back the pendulum-like pace, moving us from windowsill to floor, 
from floor to bed and back to floor, mapping haste's measure of the room, our smell, but also meuble, book dust, hanging smoke, an open bottle, everything connecting now for me, as smells will do, things that don't connect may not be mine in memory, like childhood's corridors, cats, others' bodies, and maybe other minds. All this from the spoon, sweet, grassy in my nose, cloying almost, bitter on the tongue, yet as clear as memory of pace, of smell, of movement made, strange, where is the sound of us as we moved with one another? Thank you, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. But I, I think Robert needs to kind of uh, move the screen back, but I don't know if he can see me. He can definitely hear me, I guess. <laughs> All right, we'll just give them a second. Thank you for this opportunity to hear you read tonight. I'll, I'll be I'll be the, just the, the voice for now, but uh, the, the, the image will show up soon. Um, can you tell us a little bit of your, a little bit about your background? I, I know that you, I think you were born in Russia, if I'm not mistaken, or like how did the Russian kid end up in America and became a part? <laughs> um. Yes, I was born in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. Moscow, um, of parents from different parts of the Soviet Union. Um, and, um, well, it's a kind of a complicated story, but um, basically um, in my family was involved in the human rights movement in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, because of many complications <laughs> that would arise from that, um, my parents uh, were, in a sense, or my father was basically given uh, an exit visa um, instead of going to prison. So um, they left in 77 with myself and my sister um, soon after... Uh, other parts of the family followed. Um, we ended up uh, going, you know, through Italy. Uh, some people went through Austria, but uh, we went through Italy. We were there for maybe four or five months. Um, so I turned four in Florence, I think. And then uh, we ended up immigrating to the States. Um, I guess it could have come out differently. I could have been a Mateo and uh, <laughs> there was an opportunity for my dad to have a job there, but they ended up moving to the States. Um, and, uh, and so I grew up uh, in the Boston area, going to school in English, obviously, but at home we spoke Russian and um, I continued kind of in high school, I started to actually, I mean, my family certainly kept Russian alive at home my sister and I had to uh, take in little classes with uh, the parents of, of our immigrant friends and so forth and, and read um, Russian books and poetry and um, in our, you know, outside of school. And but in school, I was in, in a normal American public school. So uh, my primary language became English. Um, I studied uh, you know, and but I studied Russian in high school a bit to kind of learn some of the stuff that I, I, I knew as a kid, but didn't really know like grammar and things like that, you know, and spelling. <laughs> so I ended up actually traveling uh, at the very tail end of the Soviet period. I, I came to Novosibirsk and spent a year there just oh. <laughs> before, going, before going to college. And it was a rather interesting year because it was the year that the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, so I, 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 uh, I entered 
uh, Soviet Moscow and Novosibirsk, and I exited <laughs> in the spring uh, a very different place. Um, so, uh, and after that, I went to college. I, I, I continued to study Russian literature, um, but of course in English, uh, or in uh, writing papers in English and um, reading. Um, that was sort of in college was when I started translating Daniel Harms um, and some other writers. Um, uh, and uh, that became my sort of double life, uh, both Russian literature and um, English language literature. Um, I don't know where that sound is coming from. I don't hear it. Probably it could be. I'll try to mute myself when I'm not speaking and then I'll. It's you. Um, but anyway, um, um, I. Um, yeah, so uh, I was, I think, somewhere in the sense of becoming a poet in English, uh, the background was always the sound of Russian language poetry to some degree, because that's what I heard at home growing up. Um, I didn't really hear much English language poetry growing up, except what was taught in school, which wasn't very much. Um, so, um, but because I was translating maybe and uh, already thinking, I think in Novosibirsk, I was already thinking at 18 that I wanted to be a writer because I was reading Dostoevsky, but who doesn't? So, <laughs> um, but I didn't end up going the, the route of the novel, um, uh, the psychological novel, but rather uh, got more and more involved in poetry. Um, partly because uh, the fiction or prose that I was writing in college and shortly after, I found that mm, it was people, who, it was poets who actually responded to it because I wasn't very good at plot uh, or, or <laughs> that kind of thing. So, so I kind of moved slowly <laughs> into poetry. Um, but yeah, it, it, uh, in, in these poems, probably some of your listeners have heard me mention the jealousy of Marina, which is of course a reference to Marina Tsutaeva's poem, um, and uh, some little references here and there to Mandelstam, whom I'm translating at the moment for many years, actually, um, his later poetry. So. You know, and um, the Oberu writers have been a very important influence on me. And I, you know, translated Harms and Vidyansky. So Russian avant-garde and modernism has always been in the background for me as a writer uh, alongside um, US and obviously in long, the long English language tradition. Um, but that has, I think, affected some of the ways that I approach writing in English, which is, in a way, a second language um, and uh, where I am both insider and outsider in a certain way. Um, so um, I'm interested in, obviously, as a translator and a, and a teacher of translation, uh, and an editor of translations, I'm very interested in the way that translation affects um, the language uh, that a text is being translated into. And uh, in my more recent poetry, I'm kind of curious and experimenting with the ways that English could change or, or find um, or kind of um, meld a lot of different kinds of uh, historical English into a contemporary um, uh, poetry that has a lot of translational um, echoes, let's say. But we can talk about that more if that's interesting. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you questions, uh, ask some questions about translations because you do this professionally, and um, you know, especially translating poetry is such a difficult task. Um, and it's, to some people, it's even kind of like. That, that's you know mission impossible because the, the you know poetry has different it, the, it's difficult to translate rhyme it's difficult to translate these underlines uh, like you know all the all the in between meanings and and curiously you kind of provided us with two translations of your short poem which sound absolutely different which um, even kind of like 
uh, shape differently or the express the thought differently. And and like kind of speaking English um, and, and studying the English, I could the poem itself is like oh those are three different pieces in some way but at the same time it's one piece how would the what in your opinion um translation of poetry is and what is the goal of the translator when they approach um a piece of poetry oh that's a big question <laughs> um yeah i think uh there are many different avenues and um, and I myself don't have a single answer because I think it really depends on the context. So if I'm translating um, something that has never been translated before into, uh, into English uh, or very little, <coughs> I tend to think about my responsibility of staying close to the original in some formal ways, uh, sometimes at least in terms of um, the, obviously in terms of the meaning and logic of a poem um, and in the specific imagery. Uh, whereas if I'm translating something that has been translated many times, I might take more liberties and try to find um, ways of um, transmitting uh, something, um, something essential to the poem, but maybe not with the same exact uh, logical movement or uh, imagery or um, sound um, uh, structures. In in the case of contemporary poetry, I think it's very different because it's a dialogue of of peers, often uh, living writers being translated by living translators, and often there's a dialogue. Uh, and I think in the in many cases having more than one translation helps get the original if you can't read the original and in the triangulation of let's say two different versions and one original one starts to see a po see a poem um, in in uh, in a more complex way so even that little poem of three lines um, with a little bit of rhyme. Uh, and in English, it's monosyllabic, which is, you know, um, very common for, for English language, but would be impossible uh, to have just one syllable words in, in the Russian. Um, so the, the structure of the language is so different and, and, uh, and there are no actual equivalents between languages. So um, what happens is this kind of interesting um, um echo um uh that's transformed a kind of transformation of a poem or what some theorists have called trans creation rather than translation um one has to just enter the poem um as if it's being written again um uh and i think that makes sense for translating contemporary poets um because you're also trying to be contemporary and uh, there's no reason to make it seem uh, like uh, from a different time or, um, but there's a lot of obviously, you know, uh, oftentimes there's a lot of context that is very difficult to transmit references to contemporary uh, culture or politics that might not be heard in another language because they aren't, uh, obvious um, to a reader. Um, so uh, then you get into this uh, problem of how do you contextualize um, certain certain contemporary poetry? Um, and there are many roots, you know, sometimes it's uh, adding commentary, which I think is actually quite uh, works very well. Um, for both contemporary poetry and especially for older poems where we might have lost a lot of the context and sense of what the references are. Um, but also it can be done with by expanding a poem, by adding, uh, let's say, you know, in, in the original, a, wor a word might have two slightly different connotations in a poem or even... Um, uh, a kind of wordplay or or something, and then in the 
if you if you have to choose only one of those meanings in the translation, then you're losing something very important. And so sometimes I've uh, even experimented with you know not being word for word, but um, adding the other dimension of that word in the translation, so that um, the the English language reader can see that there's more at play than just one decision, um, one meaning. Uh, yeah. And curiously, like you, you provided us with the translations of your work, and how does it feel to read your own poems translated into Russian, and to kind of like see the difference, maybe in meaning, or like how? The, like no, no, I'll say that. How does it feel um, to read your own translations? And curiously, you, don't, you didn't translate them yourself, right? Or no, you? um, I haven't. Uh, in a few cases, I helped the translator with some things that weren't clear, or, you know, um, especially with some younger translators, they were asking me some questions. And I, I mean, it's uh, very common if it's a living writer, you know, to be able to have that access and, and ask those questions. Um, but in the end, I can't really tell them the intention of the poem, but I can tell them the particular kind of connotations that I'm hearing in um, in the in a line or a phrase um, or a reference that they might not know or might mm -hmm. not hear. Um, but um, I I love reading these translations. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't read the translations, but I except for that one uh, example. But um, when I read them on the page or hear them uh, re read by the translators, I feel, I mean, obviously very honored to be translated into another language, but also I feel like they're finding their home uh, in some way. Uh, and in some way they're, they're becoming more whole. Uh, in some strange way, more complete, um, and perhaps it—you know—it's something about uh, translation that actually completes a poem. Uh, an idea I think that you know Salon would have uh, had about translating, or uh, several others, and even Benjamin, like this idea that the poem exists in its own language, but it it finds uh, an. Uh, its audience or its its reader actually in another language and perhaps in another place and time. Uh, you know, this is this Mandelstamian idea of the message in a bottle. Um, so uh, that the, the poem is like going out there and some, someday it will find its, its recipient, its addressee. Um, um, and and it, in a sense, when I hear uh, Alexander Skidan, for instance, read uh, a translation of one of my poems. It sounds a little bit like his poems, which I really like, but it also sounds like something I, I wanted to write but wasn't able to write. <laughs> um, so there's a sense of completion and a sense of, um, uh, I feel like they're more, they become more beautiful in some way. <laughs> uh, or That's so more, more precise maybe because uh the translator has to make certain choices uh to be precise so there there's a way in which i can get away in english with not really revealing what i mean but in the russian then it's sort of revealed <laughs> That's so curious. Uh, we have actually a question from the audience, but I'm going to follow up on, on the, our discussion. You know, being a person coming kind of like from two cultures in some, I mean, not in some way, uh, coming from two cultures, what parts of you um, where you clearly say like, oh, this is American in me, and here, oh, that's very Russian of me. Um, that's a hard question. Um, you know, maybe some superstitions <laughs> are very Russian. <laughs> the draft or the uh, uh, knocking on wood or, you know. Um, no, but uh, if I try to answer seriously, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, I was educated in the States for the most part. And so I have a kind of idea that, that uh, a sort of, a different sense of what education is than I think 
uh, and it's both good and bad. I mean, I, I think my ideas about the world are shaped in a lot of ways by um, growing up in the States. Um, but I can't say that I feel completely at home here either. You know, um, uh, even though I immig we emigrated when I was very young, I, you know, going to an American school uh, with another language, starting with another language is always a sort of a, probably for a kid is a very strange experience. And um, uh, one feels different, even if one is not really that different. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. But there's a whole set of experiences that, um, you know, I think culturally, uh, the, my probably the way that I like to discuss things or argue about things is a bit more has more to do with how I grew how those kinds of things happened in my home mm -hmm. than uh, perhaps polite English, American conversation allows. Um, um, <laughs> I but, get I feel you here. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, little things like that are, are of course, uh, but it's it's hard to. But you know, if I if I have a very uh, very close relationship or feel a very close connection to uh, a particularly American jazz, uh, I feel it in a very I think very American way. Like I feel like I know what it's talking about in a way that I don't think I would know from somewhere else. Um, a kind of interaction with the music and culture that's very, that's you, you kind of have to live it in order to feel, feel it to some degree, although it's supposed to be transcendent of barriers, but still there is some cultural specificity to any musical form, for instance, um, that, you know, you kind of grow in awareness um, of, how people interact, how people talk. I mean, as a writer, as a poet, particularly, I'm always listening to the way people talk. And, um, and so I, I think that that is, um, it, it, it constitutes me to some degree to have, um, to hear English around me. And it's, I remember, you know, living in, in Moscow, uh, when I was younger, in the, my 20s, I spent quite a lot of time there. And it, sometimes I would feel like this disconnection from English that uh, made me feel like I, I needed to go back to the States to hear the language around me and sense the, the culture if I was going to write in English. Um, so... Um, I don't know. I don't really know how to divide. You know, sometimes I have dreams that have Russian language in them, and some sometimes not. Um, um, it really depends. But I think that really depends on daily interaction. So if I'm hanging out with my mother and speaking Russian, then I might have a dream in Russian. But otherwise, I if I spend the day in English, I might not experience that. That's a very curious, I think that there is a concept, if not mistaken, like mystiza consciousness where like both identities kind of like chime in and like you're not there, you're not outside of the river, but at the same time you're not in the river. So it's kind of mm -hmm. w w some, something like that, but I guess you know better. Uh, there is a question from the audience asking, do you have any plans to write memoirs about your great relatives? No. <laughs> why, why not? Um. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, there is plenty written about my relatives, uh, and they wrote a lot themselves. My, both my grandmother and grandfather wrote memoirs, um, very extensive ones. Um, I don't have a lot to add. Um, uh, uh, and I mean, I think that there are, uh, figures in, um, uh, Soviet history, let's say that I, you know, have that I feel have been less written about. Um, um, and uh, my particular experience of my family's uh, trials and travails in, um, in as, as dissidents and so forth, like that, that story has been told and is told by people who really know that history very well. 
uh, my interaction with it was as a kid. Um, so I could write about being confused about what's going on with my family, but it's not going to be very interesting. Um, but also, I, I've do, done interviews and uh, many things for radio and so forth, of and, uh, and and articles about my experience as a kid growing up in a immigrant dissident family, you know. But you know that adds a little bit of color, perhaps, to the story. But it's not the whole story, uh, and the whole story I wouldn't be able to tell really, because it's not what I've studied. Um, uh, so I'm de devoting my time that I have uh, to translations of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, to my own writing and essays on translation. And, and uh, also, since I'm a publisher, I'm very involved in the history of um, uh, American small press movements, which are sort of uh, historically uh, parallel to Soviet Samizdat movements, um, but are very different. And in the, I'm very interested in that history. Um, and in uh, and so I write about that kind of uh, I research and write about uh, small publications and uh, marginal journals and um, sometimes in connection with uh, the Samizdat tradition that was happening all over Eastern Europe uh, or in Latin America or but. Um, uh, that, you know, I, I have lots to do. Uh, I'm translating Mandelstam, and next I'm finishing a book of Yelena Guro, who's uh, not very well known here or in Russia, an early 20th century futurist writer. Um, so I'm devoting my time to those things that I think I can, where I think I can make a contribution. Um, and then most of my time is taking up taken up by the publishing work, which is a lot of, um, some of it is publishing poets from Eastern Europe, and but it's also publishing writers from all over the world and contemporary US writers also. Uh, so I'm very involved in editing and uh, publicizing that kind of work, um, that kind of literature, translated literature. So I think I have enough on my hands. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that sounds fair. <laughs> like it seems like you're very, very busy. And and do you um what do you do in your free time? Then I would ask. Like seems you seems like you're so passionate about the things that you do, but are there the things that kind of like outside of this field that you kind of do? I mean, maybe to switch your mind. Um, uh, I, I go to the movies or, you know, I, I like old movies. I, I, luckily, I live in New York, so there's always a distraction. Like uh, <laughs> yesterday, I went to the Whitney Museum uh, and saw some excellent paintings. So uh, my girlfriend is a painter, and so we go to a lot of art-related, um, um, a lot of exhibits and contemporary art shows. Um, I mean, that's maybe the wonderful thing about living in New York. It's very busy, but it's also, there's a lot to see. I Yesterday, I also went to the theater to see a friend's play. Um, so there's plenty to do in my free time. <laughs> um, uh, when I can, I write poems, which is very <laughs> little right now, um, but uh, I'm, I'm working on that in, in some of my free time. But I guess free time is a complicated uh, idea for me. <laughs> <laughs> I see. All yeah. right. Thank you, Matvey, for this opportunity to host it tonight and to the American Center for organizing the event. And thank you to the great audience. And please fill out the survey so we can make our events better. Thank you so much. A pleasure to meet you.